In case you're wondering why this video is as long as it is, it's because I've spent a lot of time talking about this game that a grand total of five other people have played. My friends have eloquently described this game as Breath of the Wild 0.5, and I think that's a bit of an unfair comparison. Because Breath of the Wild doesn't stand a chance against this monster of a game series. Welcome to the Dark Cloud series retrospective. Part 1. Dark Cloud is a town-building, dungeon-crawling, sword-making, fishing, NPC-talking RPG that made you the hero before it was cool. At the start of the game, you control Toan. The very first thing you see when you load up the game are a group of cultists trying to awaken the Dark Genie. This was 8-year-old Mii's first experience with interpretive dance. Once they do awaken him, he immediately claims that he's hungry and proceeds to do things with his jaw that my girlfriend would be jealous of. This is you, Toan. The town is having a festival tonight, so that makes a grand total of two different dancing scenes in five minutes of starting the game. The Dark Genie fucking obliterates everything and steps on you like the degenerate you are. You wake up in hell, and God informs you that something bad has happened, in case you don't already know. But he likes you so much that he decides to bring you back with the power to save everyone. Your first real gameplay experience is in the Divine Beast Cave, where you're given a dagger and introduced to the gameplay loop. You need to worry about your health, water, and weapon condition. The dagger you start with will never break, but it will eventually start doing one damage. Challenge YouTubers should probably get on that. In order to progress to the next floor, you need a gate key dropped by one of the monsters. There's also chests with items and alamelia with objects. When you get onto the surface, you can place down the people and houses you found in the dungeon. Sometimes they'll ask you to put down their house in specific places, but I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, let's talk about the dungeon adventures. In order to get new weapons, your best bet is finding big chests. They have about a 1% chance to spawn in place of a normal chest, and most of the time contain weapons. I was lucky enough to find two different big chests on the same floor, so needless to say I'm pretty stacked. Weapons can also come with buffs and debuffs attached to them. This sandbreaker comes with the thirst debuff, so I get thirsty faster, but anytime I kill an enemy, I get thirst back. Another example is the Big Bucks Hammer, which gives more money on kill. And no, this manlet cannot use a hammer. We'll get more into that later. The weapons in Dark Cloud are what give the game life, as do the dungeons. Within every dungeon, there's springs, which restore health and water, back floors, which require a special item but give better rewards, and on specific floors, there are duels, which are quick time events, but actually interesting. <laughs> Sometimes. If you hit every button in this middle area, you'll get a perfect score, and God gives you an amethyst or some shit. Now I know what you're thinking. Josh, this is cool and all, but is this map going to be on screen for the whole video? The answer to that question, you fucking moron, is that this is a PS2 game from the 2000s. So yes. Incredibly, a few floors later, I find another big chest. Big chest can either be a happy clown or be trapped. If it's a happy clown, he'll offer you a choice between a big and a small box. The big box has a chance at weapons, and the small box has a chance at LSD. Needless to say, always pick the small box. If you find a trapped chest, always guess explosion. Poison and Curse aren't nearly as bad as the chest blowing up and you losing the item. This makes it three weapons and five floors. For comparison, some runs I'd still be using the dagger by now. Floor 6 introduces Mimics disguised as treasure chests. Since there are only 15 enemies per floor, you could probably deduce what chests are and aren't Mimics. I don't really give a shit. Once you're done finding all the things a village can't live without, like beer kegs and llamas, you can go back and start rebuilding the town. One of the best examples of how fleshed out this game is, is what happens at the store. If you've set up the store before adding in this helper named Pike, the storekeeper, Gaffer, will try and do manual setup and injure himself, resulting in him having a worse stock. If Pike is already added, he'll do the setup for Gaffer, and Gaffer will have a better stock. This game is fucking awesome. Back in the dungeon, you're introduced to limited zones, which are designed to fuck with you. This zone makes you lose experience on kill, and doesn't let you switch weapons. But with how much the store is stocked, we get a saving grace in Dran's Feather, which lets you move the appropriate amount of speed for a game this size. Floor 8 has us dueling this guy. He's very important, but you won't know why for another 50 hours. You go back to your house and find this cat you saved is already there, and the game even lets you name it. Huh. It says Cat Girl right there. Why not just say Girl Cat? Now you understand why this game is 10 out of 10 material. Your mother also doesn't question why a human with cat ears is rubbing up near your crotch. Xiao to start off is completely fucking dog shit. She has a slingshot that allows you to damage enemies at range. The only problem is that it doesn't do any damage. The floor immediately after pits you against enemies that you do completely reasonable damage to because level 5 entertainment know how to make video games. So, being the giga chad that I am, I stayed on floor 9, farming it over and over until I got a weapon for Xiao. 
I didn't. After getting a second batch of tram oil, I decide to use one of them to go to the back floor, after which I get ambushed by two bats and vow never to do it again. On my second visit to the back floor, I come across exactly two enemies on my map and around 12 chests. Now given what we've talked about before with mimics, what would be the intelligent thing to do here? If you said anything other than open every chest, then you don't know the kind of player that I am. One of the things I know about this game is that big chests can't spawn on the back floor. I open the chest anyways and start to regret my decisions. In case you couldn't tell already, this game is fucking amazing. And now that I've explained the basics, everything should go a lot smoother. So to keep things flowing, I'll just describe things that I found interesting from this point on. While looking for a weapon, I found exactly two big chests right next to each other. Surprisingly, neither of them were mimics, and neither of them were the slingshots that I needed. And just to piss me off more, they were both the same weapon. After getting a third tram oil, I realize it's going to be pretty tough to recommend this game to other people. If you go in expecting to have the look that I do, you're going to be slightly disappointed, to say the least. One thing that I can say at least is that this game is free of bugs, except for the bug that allows you to completely max out every single stat on your weapon just by grabbing out of thin air. But other than that, we're good. I also went ahead and moved to a new PC and turned RTX on. One of the mechanics of this game is the build up weapon system, where by giving your weapons extra stats on level up, you can build it up into a brand new weapon. Being able to do this before I complete the first dungeon is considered very good. My new antique sword has the slow buff on it. As soon as it stops one-shotting every enemy, I'll let you know what that does. We finally reach the final boss of the first dungeon, Dran, and we dab on him and kill him in exactly two hits. He then tells us that we need to go find the moon people. Speaking of moon people, my discord server, everyone in there is probably from the moon. Isn't that cool? If you want early access to videos like this, or you just want to tell me that League of Legends sucks, link is in the description. After defeating Dran, we move over to Matataki Village, and we meet the powerhouse that is Goro. He has a big fucking hammer and is also a crybaby over his dad, or some shit, I don't know. We venture into Wise Owl Forest. While I'm here, I decided to count exactly how many backfloor keys I managed to obtain. The answer was six. I can't even begin to fathom how lucky I am. One of the main things I wanted to get for this video was a slingshot named Steve. It's not the most powerful, but it has specific lines of dialogue for every enemy in the game. Though it's only found in one area of the game, and getting lucky enough to get a slingshot, much less the exact one I need, is pretty unrealistic to expect from the game, so I didn't bother with it too much. Except for that time where I got it without even trying, baby! We get into a duel with these werewolves, and eventually move on to fight this snake monster. We can't kill it without the serpent sword, so we get it from this tree fairy. On any other playthrough, this would most likely be the best sword for you at this point. Not this one. Though two years down the line when I inevitably get a tattoo of this sword on my arm, you can point me back to this moment. After this point, we get Goro on the team. He's just kind of worse in every way to tone, but we do end up getting a few weapons for him, so it'll pass for now. Another thing you can do with the weapons in this game is that once they hit level 5, <laughs> you can status break them and take 60% of the stats and put them onto another weapon. This also includes special buffs, so now my talking slingshot steals as well. The important thing to note is that despite what I said earlier, Xiao is now one of the best damage dealers on our team until the end of the game. After adventuring through the dungeon, we meet Master Utan, who is also coincidentally being controlled by the Dark Genie. After we defeat him, we finally meet up with the moon people who don't know how to reseal the genie. But you know who would? The actual people currently living on the moon. So let's get our spaceship going. The first thing we need is a power source in the moon orb. Its current location is in Queens. Well, this place looks weird. Queens is home to one of the best aesthetically pleasing dungeons in the game, Shipwreck. Nothing quite compares to getting on a submarine and going to an abandoned storage ship which is filled with fish that could probably give you a good time. And the music, man. The new party member we get here, Ruby the Genie, is our next ranged user. Funnily enough, the genie with an armband is less useful than the furry bait with a slingshot. The back floor of this dungeon requires you to keep a fish cold. There's nothing worthwhile on the back floor of this dungeon anyway, right? There you go, easy. If you can give me like a, a diamond here, that would be nice. <laughs> Um, legendary treasure that was revered after many years. It looks kind of like the Chronicle Sword. It just needs- It literally just needs thunder! Ah. <laughs> 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 Fucking... Alright. 
<laughs> and what do you know? Here's the weapon build chart for Tone. In case you haven't noticed, we're on the back half of this chart, which is usually reserved for endgame activities. We're barely halfway through. The final boss of Shipwreck is Ice Queen Lasaya. You're meant to take down her shield with Tone or Shao, and then swap to Ruby to damage her at range. But you don't have to use Ruby at all. You can just use these Fire Gem throwables, which make this fight slightly more manageable. We're now running into a problem with this video where a dungeon that took me two hours can be summarized in a paragraph and a half. That's because I don't want to stretch this video out longer than it needs to be. The things I do for you all. Our next stop is Muskalaka, and the Temple of Sun and Moon to find the actual ship to take us to the moon. This is basically the filler episode of the anime, so let me save you some time. We get a new sword that's immediately cast aside, make our way down to the Sun and Moon Temple, acquire a new useless party member in Ungaga, and sail to the moon. You may notice that I didn't bring up the final boss of this area. That's because it's very difficult, and I died quite a lot of times. It's honestly really upsetting how tough this boss was, and I wanted to save you all from the embarrassment that would most likely come from watching the footage of me fighting him. The moon is actually a really cool place. The main premise is getting this helicopter-using, gun-wielding rabbit to help you build a fucking robot. While on the moon getting parts, my talking slingshot informs Xiao that she has a nice tail, and the fish have scuba gear on the moon, just in case you thought this game was too serious. And Osmond is now joined the ally. I also forgot to mention that I got the Dark Cloud Sword, which isn't even its final form. After building the robot, we make our way to Dark Heaven Castle. After we beat the fuck out of the Dark Genie, it's revealed that the Dark Genie isn't really a physical entity, more so a being woven directly within the flow of time itself, basically attempting to take over every single age in history. You meet Seda in the castle, remember that guy that was in Divine Beast Cave like fucking 20 fucking minutes ago? And he reveals that he's come from 400 years in the past as an attempt to banish the Dark Genie once and for all. He originally created the Genie after making a blood pact to win the war, and used forbidden magic to come to the future in search of the Alamelia. With his last breath before the Genie takes him over, he opens a portal to the Gallery of Time, allowing you to go back to the day where the Genie was released. I level up my Dark Cloud to the point where it can be built up to the final evolution, the Seventh Heaven. The Gallery of Time is a pretty ruthless dungeon, but I'm fairly well equipped. They throw every limited zone for every character at you to test and see if you're really worth fighting the genie. The diorama for this dungeon has you building slideshows to view and take a look at what really happened with Seda. After venturing through the final dungeon and making your final preparations, you fail to stop the Dark Genie from releasing, so you're forced to fight him with the flow of time at his fingertips and he decides to throw his literal fingertips at you, forcing you to react with the correct element. He also has an unblockable wind attack, and you're forced to use a range user for the second half of his first phase. And yes, I did say second half of the first phase. For his second phase, he turns into Calamity Ganon, and shoots mouth lasers and shit. We take him out rather easily, and the Alamelia has the power to bring one person back to life, even though we have a literal god standing right next to us. Dark Cloud. It's frustrating, it's difficult, it's tedious, it's got mediocre bosses, and a bunch of PS2 era bullshit that might have turned a lot of people away. But at the same time, it has a great weapon system, a fantastic story, an innovative town building system for its time, and a goddamn amazing soundtrack. While art is subjective, when thinking about what Dark Cloud means to me, the most prevalent feeling is that of hope. That no matter how big or how small, no matter your origin point, one person can indeed make a difference in the world if they have hope. Playing Dark Cloud and its sequel when I was young sparked my imagination. I'd go out and explore forests. 
I try to help members of my community with whatever requests they had when I was able to. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years. As an adult, I've been using creative games like Dark Cloud and Minecraft as a tool to work with kids who have autism through play-based learning. People on the spectrum tend to struggle with communication, bonding, and cultivating positive social skills. However, utilizing creative games like Dark Cloud and Minecraft as a force of positive development in the lives of young people is the greatest gift that video games can give us. I've had the honor of speaking with several members at level 5 who worked on Dark Cloud and its sequel Dark Chronicle, and they were so happy to hear that the games they created so long ago are still being appreciated and enjoyed even to this day. Dark Cloud fans are some of the most passionate fans out there, and it's that same passion that made me put my career on hold for 9 months to create the Dark Cloud Compendium with the purpose of documenting and preserving all aspects of Dark Cloud's development. I hope that others will share their experiences with Dark Cloud and use the story told within it to inspire themselves and others to never give up hope and to make that change. If you would like to try this game out for yourself, PCSX2, the emulator that I used, is free to download. However, downloading the PS2 BIOS and the ROMs could be considered pirating, which I cannot condone for legal reasons. However, what I can condone is clicking the top link in the description, which may not be a subscribe link, but may actually be a Google Drive folder with some files that you'll find very interesting. Thanks for watching, and as always, have yourselves a damn good one.